After World War I in the 1920s was an age of innovation and prosperity. New inventions like washing machines, ease daily life, and the car helped to revolutionize travel. New styles and fashions appeared, and people had a newfound sense of freedom. Life was enjoyable and carefree due to the economic success experienced in a post-war setting. This era also marked a very exciting time in the world of flying known as the Golden Age of Aviation. Planes went from bulky wood and fabric biplanes to sleek metal monoplanes. The industry transformed from military use with little public support to a thriving sector that impacted nearly all aspects of American life. The changes in the aviation industry in the 1920s are directly responsible for the development of modern commercial aviation. After the war, demand for aircraft ground to a halt and the industry was in decline. Army pilots that left the military were now unemployed. The Army sold off surplus planes cheaply and these pilots bought them and traveled around the country putting on air shows. Known as barnstormers, they used local fields and barns as their showgrounds. They charged money to take people on short flights and perform dangerous, death-defying stunts. These shows spread interest in flying, but reinforced the idea that air travel was unsafe. There were no regulations for flight safety, carrying passengers, or pilot licensing. It was practically a free-for-all. Safety was also a huge issue for the Air Mail Service, which is a vital link to commercial aviation as we know it. The U.S. Postal Service flew many trial air mail flights as early as 1911 at barnstorming shows, but regular service didn't start until August 1918. History.com states, quote, Without radio communications or reliable instruments, pioneering air mail pilots relied on landmarks and instincts to guide their fragile biplanes from city to city. Sometimes a sleep lasted their faces and rain blurred their vision in open cockpits, end quote. In fact, 34 pilots died in crashes between 1918 and 1927. So, what turned things around? What made the American public embrace flight and the nation invest in its development? Enter Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh started as a barnstormer in 1922 and enlisted in the Army Reserve in 1924 for better training. Congress passed the Contract Air Mail Act in 1925, allowing private commercial aviation companies to bid on air mail routes. Light beacons, a network of landing strips, and huge concrete arrows were installed to improve the infrastructure. Their arrows pointed pilots in the right direction and many remain today. Lindbergh flew airmail route number two between his home in St. Louis and Chicago. Being an airmail pilot was dangerous. He earned his nickname Lucky Lindy for parachuting to safety twice. He charted many airmail routes still in use today, but it's overshadowed by his groundbreaking solo flight across the Atlantic. The frenzy around that flight began back in May 1919 when Raymond Orteg offered a $25,000 prize to the first aviator who flew nonstop between New York and Paris. In February 1927, Lindbergh decided to give it a whirl. The harrowing airmail flights helped build his stamina to fly in challenging conditions, and they were. Six aviators had already died attempting the transatlantic crossing. Competition was fierce. Now he needed a plane. With $2,000 of his own money and financial backers in St. Louis, he worked hands-on with Ryan Aircraft to design and build a plane that would be fast and light enough to succeed. A mere two months later, the spirit of St. Louis was ready. When the 25-year-old Lindbergh took off from Roosevelt Field in New York on May 20, 1927, the world was watching. This was truly a solo flight. He had no radio or sextant for navigation. There was no windshield because he opted for an extra fuel tank, so his only sight was through a periscope and mirror. He used two compasses, a clock, and airspeed indicator for direction and distance. To travel light and conserve fuel, he packed only a few sandwiches, two canteens, and a rubber raft. Imagine that for much of the journey, he flew only feet above the Atlantic. He battled ice, fog, and fatigue. 33 and a half hours later, an exhausted Lindbergh landed 3,600 miles away at Le Bourget Airfield in Paris. The world rejoiced and aviation would never be the same. Back in the U.S., he received a hero's welcome and the coveted $25,000 Orteg Prize. In just three weeks, he wrote an autobiography about his life and epic flight simply titled We. It was released in July and became an immediate bestseller. In his book, Lindbergh described the experience of flying, stating, quote, People who have taken their first flight often remark that no one knows the locality he lives in his life until he has seen it from above, end quote. Also in July, Lindbergh and Harry Guggenheim flew the Spirit of St. Louis to every state to promote aviation across the country. This is a vital partnership that transformed the industry. Lindbergh's national tour helped fuel his popularity and sparked public enthusiasm for flight. He became an ambassador for aviation and a pop culture icon. Soon, pop references followed, including a Mickey Mouse cartoon called Plane Crazy and hundreds of songs about him, including Lucky Lindy. This positive shift in the public's perception of flight had a tangible impact on the financial aspects of the industry. According to Flight, the complete history of aviation, quote, the Lindbergh effect would have given a mighty boost to America's struggling air transportation and airplane making businesses, even without the new hero's enthusiastic, active commitment to promoting aviation, end quote. The demand for airlines and planes led to investments in new companies and technological advancements and designs. 
Many of these advancements are directly attributed to the Guggenheims, a prominent family who made their fortune in mining. Harry and his father Daniel were aviation enthusiasts who established the Daniel Guggenheim Fund for the promotion of aeronautics. As Pioneers of Flight explains, the fund was developed to, quote, address aviation issues related to education, research, technology, and the airplane's integration into everyday life, end quote. In 1926, they helped finance Western Air Express to see if airlines could survive solely by flying passengers. They learned that airmail service was still required to keep airlines afloat, but it was the first direct link between airmail and passenger aviation. That same year, Congress established the Air Commerce Act, the first attempt to regulate aviation and its safety in the growing industry. The Guggenheims established the Full Flight Laboratory in New York, which led to one of the greatest breakthroughs in aviation history. In 1929, pilot Jimmy Doolittle successfully completed the first fully blind flight with a covered windshield. He relied only on navigational instruments, the artificial horizon, gyro compass, and altimeter. Before this, the only tools pilots had to judge position were their vision and balance. Centennialflight.net explains, quote, Achieving this milestone meant that soon weather need not limit safe flying as much as it had. Instrument flying for all segments of the aviation industry would become routine within the next decade. End quote. It marked a new era in aviation as the instruments would soon be required for all aircraft. In the decades to follow, Lumberg's continued contributions to aviation are too long to list but include charting international flight routes and developing flying techniques that can serve fuel. The Guggenheims continue to finance technological strides that revolutionized the industry, making it faster, safer, and better. Together, the achievements that started in the 1920s helped make aviation what it is today. Fasten your seatbelts and prepare for takeoff.